Hey guys, thank you for joining me once again. This week we're covering a viewer suggestion. Rejected Driftwood has asked me to help bring light to this case since it seems like there hasn't been as much coverage and maybe if enough of us talk about it, the family can possibly get some justice. We are discussing the unsolved murder of Taylor McAllister. There are a lot of things in this case that will probably frustrate you because it seems the evidence is right there in everyone's faces, yet this case is considered cold. As always, I invite you to join me as we discuss this unfortunate situation. Sit back, relax, and let's dive in. Taylor McAllister was born in Melbourne, Florida on July 21, 1994 to Leslie and Bill McAllister. She was one of five children. She was often described as a social butterfly possessing a very bubbly personality. Taylor was close to her family and had a love for the beach. She could spend all afternoon on the water searching out dolphins, but her one true love was music. She was not only a talented singer, but guitar player as well. She was self-taught, even sharing her passion with the world through her YouTube channel where she uploaded covers of popular songs. Her friends claimed Taylor always had headphones, and if she didn't, then she was singing. Taylor had a zest for life and always did things to the fullest, so it wasn't a complete shock when at the age of 20, she fell head over heels for a young man named Joshua. After being together for a few months, the pair married, and shortly following this milestone, another occurred. Taylor finds out she's expecting. Her family recalls that Taylor was very excited about the prospect of becoming a mother. She gave birth to twin girls that she named Charlie and Madison. From the outside looking in, Taylor's life was perfect, a loving husband and beautiful children. But on the inside, the pressures from her new roles began to take a toll. Shortly after the twins were born, Taylor developed an addiction to pain medication, which she was prescribed. Reportedly, her and Joshua were both in the throes of addiction. This, combined with children, began to weaken their marriage. Her parents were very candid about Taylor's drug use and her struggles for the last few years of her life. When she was on the drugs, she became a completely different person, even to the point of burning out relationships that were once close to her. By August of 2016, she and Joshua separated. Taylor left her children with her mother while she moved in with a friend to sort her life out. This was a short-lived experience, though. Taylor and her friend had a falling out, and she soon moved out. It was around this time when she was introduced to a man named Robert Butler III, also known as Bert. Bert was the heir to a successful carpet company called Bob's Carpet and Flooring. Bert was also the black sheep of his family, causing much strife. He had no involvement in the family business, and his siblings accused him of drug abuse, misuse of company funds, and selling products for personal profit. He also had a lengthy rap sheet dating back to the early 90s where he was convicted of aggravated assault with a firearm. Over the next two decades, he picked up more charges mostly pertaining to drug possession. His relationship with Taylor is kind of muddy since no one knows for sure. Her parents claimed she was living with him, whereas Bert states it was more of an arrangement between the pair where she would provide service than leave. The McAllisters believe Bert acted as a sugar daddy, providing their struggling daughter with drugs, money, and whatever she desired in exchange for her company. After becoming involved with Bert, Taylor's communication with her parents became sporadic. They were unaware of where or who Taylor was with at the time or if she was even safe. In September of 2016, Leslie finally heard from her daughter in the form of a text message wishing her a happy birthday. 
But unbeknownst to her, this would be the last correspondence she would ever have with her daughter. On the morning of December 22, 2016, a man searching for Can stumbled upon a horrific scene. At 7.45 in the morning, in an alleyway located in the area of the 2100 block of 63rd Avenue in St. Petersburg, Florida, was the battered and bruised body of Taylor. Taylor was found only wearing a gray t-shirt which was wrapped around her shoulders. The autopsy revealed she suffered from several contusions, bruises, and bug bites. She had extensive trauma to her head and neck and tire marks across her legs. She also had glue residue located on her face and wrist, and DNA was recovered from underneath her fingernails. Her cause of death was from asphyxia, leading investigators to officially claim the crime as a homicide. At the time of her discovery, there were a lot of varying assumptions regarding the nature of her death. The public really focused on her lifestyle choices rather than the results of her autopsy. She was viewed as a junkie, and it seemed she was being blamed for her own death. But once the toxicology report revealed that this was not a drug overdose, the investigation began to take off. Joshua was questioned, who explained his estranged wife had been staying with 52-year-old Robert Butler. Robert was interviewed the same day in which he claimed he hadn't seen her since the 17th and they didn't really know one another. She was what he called a working girl. Butler had scratches present on his face and arms and possessed fresh bruises on his shoulders. Initially, he denied being around Taylor, but when pressed enough, he began to tell the story of what occurred that fateful night. He claimed days leading up to her death, Taylor became very sick while at his Palm Harbor home. He states he called two of his younger friends, Deontay Baker and Karan Archer, to help take Taylor to the hospital. Supposedly, Deontay Baker was his drug dealer at the time. He reportedly didn't want police or ambulances at his home, due to the illegal activity that was occurring, and felt that this would be the best route. With the inclusion of two new parties, police tracked down both men for questioning. There were a lot of inconsistencies between the stories, but what is known is somewhere between Robert's home and the alleyway, Taylor died. Bert said she needs to go to the rehab or whatever, Mm -hmm. because she was getting, I guess she was going strong on drugs, strong. So she was in there, and she's butt naked, and she was super high. And she had her legs open, and just was open. Okay. So that, and then... What what was she saying? Was she talking? Yeah, she, I don't remember. I don't know what she said, but But I she's talking. She was super high. So, they said she got to rehab. We were finna take her to the rehab place. Uh, So, uh, I guess that's what they said, we were finna take her to the rehab place. So, where we going? She just died. Okay. Deontay Baker claimed during his first interview that Taylor was barely conscious when he arrived at the home. During the first interview, Baker claimed Taylor was lying on Robert's bed, naked, covered in her own urine, and moaning in pain. He states she was transported from the bed by a sheet and placed in Robert's white Toyota Tundra in order to take her to the hospital. Archer, who drove the truck, claims he was unfamiliar with the area and was unable to pinpoint the closest hospital. Reportedly, the men passed eight hospitals between Robert's home and the alleyway. During the trip, Baker claimed Taylor was sitting up in the back seat when she suddenly fell over. An odor began emitting from her body and at this point, he believed she had died. The duo contacted Robert to figure out what they should do next. In this time period, a total of 20 calls are exchanged between the parties. Ultimately, Robert tells them to not bring her back to his house and to just drop her off somewhere she wouldn't be found. Baker refused, stating she needed to be found, and they chose to dump her in the alley, where she was also ran over while they were pulling away. After the men dropped her off, they allegedly returned to Robert's home where they burned their clothing, destroyed the surveillance footage of the property, and disposed of the mattress she was laying on. Baker told police they also scrubbed everything clean of Taylor, taking all of her belongings and scattering them amongst dumpsters at different apartment complexes. He also was ordered to take Robert's truck and have it detailed the following day. 
After speaking to both men, investigators also spoke to the maid who came to clean specifically Robert's room the following week. The maid claimed there was nothing out of the ordinary other than what appeared to be a woman's purse. Police were able to trace the DNA found underneath her fingernails back to Robert. However, they claimed this was not solid enough evidence since she was staying with him at the time of her death. Despite all of this stacked against Robert, investigators only charged the men with misdemeanors, which wouldn't be filed for almost a year after her death. A search warrant was acquired for Robert's property on December 12, 2017. But the focus of this search didn't seem to be in relation to Taylor's murder. Inside of his home, police found drug paraphernalia, guns which reportedly belonged to his son, and Taylor's guitar and Bible. Court proceedings started in December of 2018. From the search, police were able to charge Robert Butler with a felony possession of marijuana, failure to report a death, and felony possession of ammunition. Deontay Baker received failure to report a death and money laundering. Karan Archer received failure to report a death. Police claimed that due to the lack of evidence, they were unable to prove murder. It didn't matter how much the finger was pointed, they claimed they had to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt and it just couldn't be done. Butler pled guilty to his charges. For Taylor's death, he received one year in jail and for the laundering, he received 40 months initially but this was reduced to 27 when he was used in securing a conviction against Baker. Karan Archer received six months for his involvement. Deontay Baker received a much longer sentence due to the money laundering charges and was still sitting in jail. The McAllisters feel Taylor's death was used as a way to secure the federal charges of money laundering. They state police worked with federal agents to build this case using hers in order to close it. Her family has filed a suit against Robert for neglect in getting medical help for Taylor. Bill McAllister stated, quote, She deserves justice for what was done to her. We deserve it. Her girls deserve it. Our family. Someone has to be held accountable one way or another. End quote. Her parents want to remind the public that her addiction didn't define her. They hope people will see her picture and hear her story and come forward with information that will lead to an arrest. Taylor's parents use her videos as a way to remind her children of the mother they hardly knew. They now refer to her as Angel Mommy. The family feels they will never have closure but hope for justice. They are doing what they can to put Taylor's case in the spotlight, and they're only getting started and have no plans of stopping. If you have any information regarding this case, please contact the tip line. You can also follow the family's Facebook page where they regularly post updates in relation to the case. I'll go ahead and put all of these links in the description of this video in case anyone is interested. There is also a petition I'll link to bring awareness to law enforcement to continue to look into Taylor's case. Another thing I wanna share is the family has chosen to release Taylor's crime scene photos. I obviously did not show them in this video, but I will link the video from YouTube in the description as well if you're interested in seeing those. Viewer discretion is always, but I feel these pictures really do put this situation into perspective. It shows just how damaged she was and really makes you question how they didn't think this was a homicide in the beginning. This family has been through a lot and they're in a lot of pain and I really hope law enforcement will consider revisiting their daughter's case. To this day, no one has been formally charged with the homicide of Taylor McAllister. I want to thank Rejected Driftwood again for sharing this case with us. 
As always, I invite you to share your thoughts and comments below so we can chat about this. If you found this to be informative, please consider giving it a thumbs up to let YouTube know you want more. And if you're not subscribed yet, you should because we would love to have you under the ash tree. Hopefully we can be a catalyst in helping this family get some peace. I want to thank you all for tuning in as always and showing your love and support. You're all the best and I will see you in the next one. Bye friends.